What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to another audiobook read through thing. So, so we are reading through epilogue number five today. Now, this is the epilogue of the Bobby Dots conclusion, not Nexi. Uh, I know it's been very, very long overdue, but I, I've heard this, this epilogue is pretty average, so I don't think we've been missing out on much. I haven't actually read the epilogue either, so this is going to be a reaction from me too. Um, but yeah, this, uh, yeah, let, I think we should just get straight into it, honestly. Um, I will be covering, I, I will be doing the leaks of the Nexi epilogue very soon as well, because that has been, that has all been leaked. Uh, and I will be doing the story Nexi too. And then the book Nexi comes out in, I think like a, like a week and a half or something like that. So it's coming very soon. And then we'll do full audiobooks of all of those stories. Ah, <sighs> so much work. <laughs> Anyway, let's get straight into this. Lucia shoved one of her kinky curls away from her ear as she bent to listen to the radio. She and Kelly had managed to get the radio working, but, they'd all, but all they'd gotten so far was static, until now. Lucia was sure she could hear a voice coming through the crackly hisses. Behind Lucia, Adrian's footfalls filled the room with an edgy metrical tapping. Lucia understood Adrian's agitation, but his pacing was getting on her nerves, and it was making it impossible to pass the static from the voice she thought she'd heard. Lucia lost her patience. She whipped around and glared at Adrian. Stop that, she hissed. Adrian ceased pacing. He looked at her with two raised eyebrows. She immediately felt awful. Sorry, I need to listen. And you're pacing? Sure, Adrian said. For a moment, his handsome features lost some of the tightness that had mar what, that had marred them since the last since the thing they now called the mimic that agreed to that name after Lucy had found the user's manual that had a picture of the thing on it had started killing them one by one. Adrian gave Lucia a fair imitation of his usual smile as he gestured at the radio. Do you hear something? Lucia nodded. I think so. She looked at Kelly, who was fiddling with the radio's dial. Did you hear that? Did you hear it? Oh my god, I'm so bad at reading. <laughs> um, uh, it just takes a while to get into. Um, Kelly nodded. Mm -hmm. It's distorted, but I think it's a voice. I think so too, Lucia said. Can we boost the frequency? Kelly shifted the radio and adjusted its antenna. And there it was. It was a voice. Still a little garbled. The voice was deep and awkward sounding, broken, its words spaced apart as if the speaker was trying to get out their words. <laughs> we are in Pete's area. Lucia leaned back, in her eyes wide, she looked at Kelly and Adrian. Jace, who had been under the table drawing, crawled out and stood. He frowned at the radio. Did I just hear Pete's area? Lucia ignored the question. She leaned over and tweaked the radio dials just a hair. The voice spoke again. It came in a bit clearer. We're trapped. Stage. Abandoned pizzeria. Kelly grabbed the radio's microphone. Could you repeat that, please? More static. Then, trapped in old pizzeria under new construction behind stage. Kelly keyed the mic again. Are you saying you're trapped in the old pizzeria under the new pizzaplex? In a room behind the stage? Kelly's pale skin was flushed with excitement, a burst of static. Then, yes. Lucia grabbed the mic. Who are you? How'd you get there? Why is my WhatsApp going off? <laughs> uh, who are you? How'd you get there? Where's the room exactly? More static. Lucia spoke into the mic again. Are you still there? More crackling and spitting. And then a voice said, help. Lucia and the others stared at one another. There's someone else down here too? Jace asked. I actually didn't know about this. This is, this is kind of crazy. I'm, I'm actually invested in the epilogues again now. Because it's not going to be the same characters over and over again. No, I'm joking. Um, they are good. He shoved his drawing pad in his pocket and carefully replaced his pens in the pocket protector. He'd been sketching under the table. Lucia knew he was doing it to escape the reality of their situation. Now he was clearly ready to be part of it again. I guess it's possible, Adrian said. We didn't move all these boxes and costume racks behind the stage when we were looking for a way out. There could be some kind of room back there where others got trapped. If we got in here, others could have. Lucia agreed. We need to get them out, Kelly said. The more of us there are down here, the better chance we have of staying alive. We also need to find Joel and Wade. 
Adrian said, oh yeah, <laughs> they died last epilogue, didn't they? Could we be talking to Joel and Wade? Kelly asked. Lucia frowned. Could they? There was so much static that the voice was coming through too fuzzy to identify. How'd they get a radio? Jace asked. Maybe they found one in whatever room they're in, Kelly said. But they were going to the systems room, Adrian said. Then they, then they all started talking at once, throwing out theories about who was on the radio and where they were and what they should do about it. Finally, Adrian held up one of his large, perfect hands. Stop! Lucia closed her mouth. She flushed. He was right. They were babbling, and it wasn't accomplishing anything. Adrian sighed. The only way we're going to get any answers is to try to find the room behind the stage. Lucia looked at the barricaded door. She really didn't want to leave the office, but he was right. She nodded. So did Kelly. Jace swallowed hard, and then nodded too. Okay, Adrian said. Let's do this. Lucia handed Adrian a box of stage props and paused to wipe sweat from her eyes, as she had been doing this, as she had been doing every other second since she and the others had left the office. She froze and listened hard. She turned in a full circle. They were still alone. Somehow, the group had managed to deconstruct their barricade and make it from the office to the backstage area without encountering the mimic, unless the robot endoskeleton had figured out how to walk without making its signature hissing and rasping tap and no longer shorted out lights when it was nearby, it wasn't close. Even so, every nerve ending in Lucia's body was on alert and she had never worked so hard to hear every little tiny sound around her and to discern every iota of the details in her surroundings. Look! Jace exclaimed. Shh! Kelly admonished. Jace flushed. Sorry, he whispered. He joined the others in turning yet another full circle to be sure they were alone. Then Jace pointed at the wall. It's one of those doors made to look like part of a wall, he whispered. See? He pointed at a narrow door-shaped seam. Lucia stepped up next to Jace and examined the wall. He's right, she whispered. She frowned. Why is there a hidden door back here? Kelly shook her head. This place is owned by Fazbear Entertainment. Why does Fazbear Entertainment do half of what it does? Good point, Lucia said. She stepped up and felt around the hidden door. How do we get it open? How do we even know this is the right place? Adrian asked. He was moving the last of the boxes that had obscured the hidden door. Lucia looked around. The voice said behind the stage, the only other enclosed place is that costumes closet, and it's open. Lucia shuddered. They'd found Nick's remains scattered near the open door to the closet. Sticky blood was everywhere. Lucia had stepped in some, and she'd been scraping the sole of her hiking boot on the floor ever since. Out, damned spot, Lucia thought now, suppressing a demented giggle that would have given away the hysteria that she was only barely keeping at bay. Lucia nearly jumped out of her skin when Adrian knocked on the camouflaged door panel. What are you doing? Jace squeaked. Before we try to get the door open, Adrian said reasonably. Shouldn't we see if someone else is in there? I think... Jace began. An answering knock came from the other side of the door. Jace gasped and leaped over to press against Lucia. Her on-the-alert senses were assaulted by the stale smell of Jace's sweat. She forced herself to pat his shoulder, a half-hearted attempt to, c to comfort him. Kelly leaned toward the door. Can you hear me? Who's in there? She called out softly. They all listened hard, but they heard nothing. What if they've run out of oxygen or something? Kelly asked. Adrian nodded. We need to get in there. He began pressing his fingers along the door seams. Maybe there's a press pressure latch somewhere. If we could just... Lucia heard a click. The door opened a few inches. They all sucked in a collective breath and retreated a couple steps. Lucia hugged herself, trying to rub away the goosebumps that had just erupted on her arms. Adrian rolled his shoulders and stepped forward. He grabbed the edge of the door and pulled it open. The lighting behind the stage was only slightly better than that in the rest of the pizzeria. In addition to a couple of dim wall sconces, the area received a few half-hearted sprays of illumination from dying stage lights attached to metal scaffolding overhead. Those sprays, though weak, stretched in through the open door. Lucia and the others moved together until they were shoulder to shoulder. As one, they stepped forward and peered into the small room. Lucia wasn't sure what she'd expected them to find. Joel and Wade? Another group of stupid kids who'd broken into the pizzeria on a lark. A construction worker. 
In one glance, it was clear that the very small, maybe 8 foot by 8 foot room contained none of those people. In fact, it was an empty, it was empty of any people at all. The only thing in the room was a collection of costumes, like the ones they'd found in the parts and service room. Oh no, the mimic is hiding in one of them. Right? Right? It has to be. It has to be. Adrian broke away from the others and took a step into the small room. Careful, Jace gasped. Adrian gave a sharp nod. He looked around and called out softly. Anyone in here? He received no answer. The room was si silent and still. Until it wasn't. Suddenly, the costumes on the right side of the room began to rustle. The chur of fabric against fabric combined with a barely there crackle. And then Lucia heard a hiss and a rasp. Adrian! She cried. Look out! Lucia lunged forward and grabbed Adrian's hand. She yanked hard. She acted just in time. The stage lights flickered. As Adrian fell back toward Lucia, a costume, one with matted brown fur and a pale face that was vaguely reminiscent of a monkey, surged out from the surrounding characters. A grating sound combined with a whir as the deranged looking primate leaped forward toward Adrian and tried to grab Adrian's arm. The monkey paw's fur was torn and Lucia caught the glint of metal as it swiped at Adrian's bicep. Adrian cried out and grabbed his arm. All the lights went out. They were surrounded by blackness. It's the mimic! Lucia cried as she tugged at Adrian. <laughs> Sorry, that was really um, random. <laughs> it's Eleanor. Um, her mind replayed at hypersonic speed what she had read in the user's manual about the robot's limbs and torso expanding and contracting to fit into any animatronic costume. Lucia could feel Adrian flailing, trying to keep his balance. Somehow, he steadied himself. Go! he bellowed. Jason Kelly hadn't needed the command. Lucia could hear their footsteps. They were already running. Bumping into the boxes and costumes in the backstage area, Jace and Kelly were bumbling in the darkness, heading toward the parted stage curtains. Adrian and Lucia, with a grinding, tapping mimic too close behind them, raced after their friends. Lucia tried not to think about what the thing pursuing them... Uh, try... Yeah. Lucia tried not to think about the thing pursuing them. She couldn't. She had to concentrate on feeling her way through the murk to get beyond the stage curtains. Once she was sure, she felt the tip of a sharp metal finger catch on the back of her woven vest, and she pushed herself harder. Her vest pulled against her chest, and then it went loose again. Adrian grabbed her hand, and he hauled her even along even faster. Beyond the curtains, the dining room lights were still on. That light guided them all toward the front of the stage. There, now they could see where they were going, they picked up speed. Not bothering with the stairs, all four of them jumped off the stage and vaulted past a jumble of overturned chairs. Hopping over the body parts that were scattered through, throughout the area, they turned toward... Oh my god, they turned... <laughs> they turned through a tangle of limp party streamers and tore through the dining room. Without discussing it, because they clearly had no time to do that, they all ran toward the main hall. Lucia intended to head back to the office, the others apparently did too. Only once did Lucia risk a glance over her shoulder. When she did, she saw the mimic, its arms extending out like those of an orangutan, plodding past a pile of concrete rubble on the arcade side of the dining room. Thankfully, although the mimic was deadly and sneaky, Adrian now realised it didn't move very fast. Adrian and the others were able to get to the office before the mimic reached the lobby. They quickly rebuilt their barricade, and then they all clustered in the middle of the room, panting, clutching at one another, their eyes wide, their attention fixated on the office door. Several seconds passed as they all listened hard. Seconds turned into a minute, then two. They heard nothing. Where did it go? Jace whispered. Adrian glanced down at his friend, who was clutching Lucia's hand so hard, Lucia's knuckles were white. Lucia was wincing, but she did nothing to shake Jace off. Adrian shook his head. That was a good question. Kelly touched his arm. You're bleeding pretty badly, she whispered. Adrian looked down. Blood was streaming down his arm from a gash in his bicep. He remembered the searing pain when the mimic had grabbed for him. Then, running for his life, He'd felt nothing. Now he realised his arm was throbbing. I think I saw a first aid kit in the filing cabinet when I was rummaging through it, Lucia said. Lucia gently disengaged Jace's hand 
and stepped over to the filing cabinet, which was once again on its side on top of the desk. She pulled open a drawer and plucked out a small first aid kit. For the next few minutes, Adrian let Lucia and Kelly attend to his gash, while Jace hovered nearby. Jace's face was so white it was practically transparent. You really need stitches, Kelly said, but these butterfly bandages should keep hold it, should help hold it. She wrapped a gauze bandage tightly around Adrian's arm. Adrian nodded, but he wasn't thinking about his arm. He was thinking about Wade and Joel. He had a very bad feeling about them. Finally, the girls stopped fussing over his arm. Adrian thanked them and then said out loud what he'd been thinking. We need to find Joel and Wade. No one said anything. Adrian knew why. They were probably dealing with the same image he was dealing with. The image of Joel's and Wade's mutilated bodies. The mimic was obviously as clever as it was lethal. Adrian thought it entirely possible that the mimic had outsmarted the two not-so-clever jocks. Jace piped up. Are we sure we want to go back out there? He blinked at the office door. Adrian shook his head. I wasn't planning to go out there. He pointed at the vent cover under the table. We'll go that way. We? Jace squeaked. I'll go with you, Lucia said, her voice cracking only si slightly. Adrian repeated the head shake. No, you need to stay here. See if you and Kelly can get something else on the radio. Maybe some real people this time. Kelly let out a humorous guffaw. Who thought that thing was so devious? Maybe I should read some more of that user's manual, Lucia said. Adrian nodded. Yeah, do that too. He looked at Jace. Jace, buddy, I could use your help. Are you up for it? Jace chewed his thin lower lip. He blinked and sniffled. Then he nodded. Sure, Adrian, I'm with you. The inflection of both sentences went up on the end as if Jace was more questioning than affirming. No one pointed that out. The duct beyond the vent cover was bigger than Jace had expected it to be. It was plenty wide and tall enough for Adrian, who was six, who was eight inches taller than Jace's d diminutive five, six. It was cleaner too. Jace could feel a faint breeze in the duct. Somewhere a fan was circulating air, which apparently was keeping the faint layer of dust collecting on the metal to a minimum. The duct wasn't, however, all that stable. Just a few feet from the office, as Adrian and Jace crawled around a bend in the duct work, the steel floor of the duct sagged when one of the seams popped apart a few inches. Jace yelped at the resulting tinny clunk. I thought these things were made of galvanized steel. Galvanized steel, he called out to Adrian, who was a couple feet ahead of him. Jace could just barely see Adrian. The only light in the duct work came through vent covers spaced several feet apart. Shh! Adrian stopped and, and co cocked his head to look back over his shoulder at Jace. A faint ray of light reflected off the whites of Adrian's eyes. He pointed at the metal grate of a vent cover just ahead of them. If the mimic is out there, Adrian whispered, it could hear us. Good point, Jace thought. He nodded meekly. He didn't even want to be there. He felt like a rat scurrying around inside a metal maze. But, of course, he went along with Adrian. He always did. They crawled for another few feet past the vent cover. Another seam cracked apart as Adrian crept over it. Careful, Adrian whispered. Some of these uh, some of these joints are rusting. Duh, Jace thought. That was why he'd said what he'd said about galvanized steel. He was an artist, not a scientist. But he thought galvanized steel was treated to resist rust, or yeah. Resist was the operative word, he guessed. Maybe, eventually, all metal rusted. Whatever. All he knew was that the duct work wasn't all that stable. He wondered where they'd end up if the duct collapsed under them. They crawled on in silence. Sweat dripped off Jace's nose. Dust made his eyes burn. His knees were starting to ache. I don't think it's much further, Adrian whispered, as, he, as if he sensed Jace's discomfort. Then Adrian froze. So did Jace. They were approaching a vent cover, and beyond it, something was moving. Tap, hiss, rasp. It was the mimic. Adrian turned and put a finger to his lips. Jace ignored the unnecessary instruction. He had no intention of making a sound or a movement. 
He was a mute statue. <laughs> I don't know why I struggled with that word. A mute statue. Uh, he willed himself to be invisible. The tap hiss rasp sound moved closer. The illumination in the duct nearly disappeared. Jay stared at the vent cover. He had to suppress a gasp. Beyond the metal grill, two bright white eyes staring out of the face of a butterscotch-coloured furry costume looked into the duct. Something whirred. The vent cover rattled. Jay stopped breathing. He closed his eyes tight, as if not looking at the mimic would make it go away. Jay started counting the seconds, wondering how long he could hold his breath. He'd gotten to 19 when he heard Adrian's athletic shoes squeak against the duck's metal side. Jace opened his eyes. Adrian was crawling forward again. He would only be doing that if the mimic had moved off. Even so, Jace hesitated. Then he checked the vent. Light was streaming through the spaces between the grill once more. Okay, he thought. He forced himself to follow his friend. Adrian had hoped they'd be able to take the ductwork systems to the systems room. The ductwork right to the systems room, yeah. Which was where he wanted to start his search for Joel and Wade. That was where Joel had wanted to go. So Adrian figured that the best place that was the best place to begin. Unfortunately, he and Jace had encountered an air handler unit, an AHU. The son of a contractor, Adrian knew most ductwork had these large metal boxes that contained a blower, filters, and heating and cooling elements. An AHU had blocked the bend Adrian had wanted to take. Because of this, they ended up in the employee break room instead of the systems room. Adrian looked around the locker-lined room filled with upended tables and chairs. Aside from the furniture and other debris, the room was empty. He quickly and quietly pulled himself out of the duct and bent to offer Jace a hand. Once Jace was on his feet, Adrian motioned for Jace to follow him. He didn't bother to explain to Jace why they were here instead of in the systems room, and Jace didn't ask. Adrian had a feeling Jace was still recovering from being so close to the mimic by that vent cover. Adrian had to admit it had freaked him out too. He didn't have time to think about it though. Come on, Adrian whispered. He quickly led Jace past a few broken chairs toward the door to the back hall. Jace pressed close to Adrian. Jace was clammy and smelly, but Adrian figured he was too. Adrian slowed. Oh, <laughs> Adrian slowly opened the door to the hallway. Pausing a beat, he leaned his head out and looked in both directions. The hallway was clear. It was quiet. No tapping footsteps. Adrian looked to his left, toward the end of the hall. The system's room door was standing open. Good. Adrian nudged Jace, and then he trotted as quickly and quietly as possible over the hallway's black and white tiles. They couldn't be totally silent. Their feet made scuffling sounds over the dirty floor, but they were as stealthy as they could be. In five seconds, which felt like five minutes, they covered the distance to the systems room. Adrian looked over his shoulder to check the hallway behind them. It was still empty. He ducked into the systems room and waited until Jace followed him in. Then he shut the door. Adrian and Jace looked around. The systems room was a shadowed L-shaped space filled with a bank of control panels along one wall and an industrial-sized furnace flanked by metal maintenance scaffolding. The furnace had multiple rectangular chutes and cylindrical ducts, many of which looked to be collapsing. Something in the furnace was running, though. Adrian could hear the faint rhythmic hum of what sounded like a fan. What's that smell? Jace asked. Adrian inhaled. It's just the furnace, he said. Old furnaces can smell like rotten eggs when they- No, not that smell. The other one. Jace took a tentative step toward the bend in the wall. He peered around the corner. Jace let out a squawk and fell back into Adrian. He bounced off Adrian and fell to his knees. Bending over, Jace made a gasping, he heaving sound as Adrian shot forward to see what had upset Jace so badly. Adrian managed to stay silent when he saw the first leg. He didn't scream or even gasp when he saw an arm a few feet from the leg. When he looked beyond the arm and saw the mutilated hand lying on one ear, its eyes staring. What? Oh, sorry, I said, oh my god, I'm so bad at reading what is going on today. When he looked beyond, I'm so sorry, by the way. When he looked beyond the arm and saw the mutilated head lying on one ear, its eyes staring, Adrian still managed to keep it together. I don't know what's going on with me today. I, I guess I'm 
not concentrating very well. <laughs> My brain is just not on, uh, so I apologize, but yeah. Uh, with a massive force of will, he tamped down a wretch and he turned away from Wade's remains. Adrian closed his eyes and breathed in and out three times. He went back to Jace and put a hand on the little guy's shoulder. You going to be okay? Adrian asked. Jace was curled forward, hugging himself. He didn't look up, but he nodded. Stay here, Adrian said. Jace didn't respond. Adrian looked back at the system's room door. He listened, no rasping tap. The mimic had been here, obviously, but it wasn't here now. Adrian took a deep breath and steeled himself. Forcing his feet into motion, he went around the corner. Adrian had to step carefully to avoid all Wade's dissected parts. Wade's blood was everywhere too. Adrian couldn't stay away from all of it. It was splashed all over the floor. Tiptoeing gingerly, Adrian made his way toward Wade's torso. No, wait, it wasn't Wade's torso, it was Joel's. Both Wade and Joel had worn the same purple and yellow team shirts, but Joel was a bigger guy. It was his torso that lay, bisected horizontally, at the bottom of what looked like a vertical furnace shaft. Adrian looked around. He spotted Wade's torso against the wall. Adrian tore his gaze from the gore strewn around him. He concentrated on the hum he'd been hearing since they entered the room. If there was a big enough fan, there might be a way out of this place. Oh no, is he going to do the same thing? Adrian made himself focus on that thought and not was all around him. If they were going to survive, they all had to control their emotions and find a way to think logically. Adrian stepped over two disembodied legs. He thought they were Joel's. Doing his best not to touch the sides of the furnace opening above the legs, Adrian stuck his head into the opening and looked up. Just as he'd thought, the chute, which had handholds and footholds for climbing, led up to a massive fan. Adrian retreated. He returned to Jace. Squatting down next to his friend, Adrian repeated his earlier question. Are you going to be okay? This time, Jace looked up. His eyes were red and his lips quivered. But he cleared his throat and asked, Is it both of them? Adrian nodded. Yeah. They were silent for several seconds. Adrian had never much liked Joel or Wade. Joel especially could be a real jerk sometimes, but he hadn't deserved what had happened to him. No one did. Adrian touched Jace's shoulder. There's a bit of good news. Jace wiped his eyes. What's that? I think Joel and Wade were trying to get out through a chute that leads up to the ceiling. There's a big fan up there between the ceiling and the crawl space under the roof. If we could get it turned off, we could find a way out, Jace said, writing it infinitesimally. <laughs> infinitesimally. Infinitesimally. I know what it means, it, it like infinitely small, but I can't say it. <laughs> Adrian squeezed Jace's shoulder. Exactly. Then let's do that, Jace said. He pushed himself off the floor and stood. Oh no, I can't believe they're actually doing it. Oh no, the same thing is gonna happen. I mean, to be, to be fair, the, like the fan is the only way out that I can see, like currently, like, there's no other way out, really. I can't think of any other way they're going to get out. And the fan seems like a viable technique. They just need to turn the fan off. What was, what was it that turned it back on last time? Was it the fact that the Mimic came in? Oh, no, 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 no. They, the Mimic went in, so they tried... Yeah, the Mimic... The Mimic came into the room and that turned the fan off because um, when he's nearby things, it like, it stops them working or does it make them work? I, don't, I can't remember, but I, I, they, they try to lead him into the room and then escape, but they weren't quick enough, right? So if they can find a way to actually like permanently turn off the fan, then that is the way out. Like they can definitely get out through that fan. Um, it's just very dangerous and... I am really intrigued to see what's going to happen, if the same thing is going to happen, or if they're actually going to get out at some point, and then... I don't know, I don't know where these epilogues are going. Anyway, uh, it's not finished yet, hang on. Lucia threw up her hands and backed away from the table that held the uncooperative radio. It's no use, she sighed. The signals aren't making it past the building. Yet, Kelly said. She was sitting in a chair in front of the radio. We have to keep trying. Lucia shook her head. I'm not as good with radios as I am with robots and computers. 
Lucia thought about how much she'd been enjoying her robotics class in school. After this, assuming there was an after this, she wasn't so sure she'd be as excited about robots as she used to be. The Mimic, although she and the others had been thinking of it more as a creature than something mechanical, was, after all, a robot. It was strange and a fiendish robot, but it was a robot, and because of it, Lucia wasn't so sure she wanted anything to do with robots anymore. While I keep tinkering with the radio, Kelly said, why don't you see if you can find out anything else about the Mimic? Lucia glanced at the user's manual she flung to the floor near the barricade that blocked the door. She'd read it uh, back forward and backward. The only thing she'd learned was where its deactivation switch was, ooh, at the back of its neck. But if you couldn't get close to the thing without being ripped apart, what good was that knowledge? Lucia sighed and stretched. She rubbed her sore back. She'd been bending over the radio so long that her lower back muscles were screaming at her. You're a lot more patient than I am, Lucia said to Kelly. I want to make a bet. I bet that in a future epilogue, they're going to find a way to um, kind of like freeze the mimic or like topple him over or something. They're going to turn off the switch and they're going to be like, yes, we, we did it. Uh, we can now escape through the fan. But then the mimic is going to come to life, even though the switch is off because the mimic is like possessed or something. I don't know. I, I feel like there's going to be something like that. I feel like the the actual computer power doesn't matter because the Mimic is actually possessed by William Afton. I feel like it's going to be something like that, right? Um, yeah, okay. Interesting. Uh, and then we have Kelly looked up and smiled. Ooh. Ooh. Sorry, I just read ahead. Kelly looked up and smiled. Confession. She blushed. I've never told anyone at school this. Lucia frowned, wondering what she was about to hear. I'm a ham radio freak, Kelly said. I have a setup at home. I talk to people from all over the world. I have more friends than I've never seen face to face than I have. I even know people at school. Why is that a confession? Lucia asked. Kelly flipped her now straggling brown hair off her shoulder. It's pretty nerdy. Hey, Lucia said. Watch the way you say that word. You're talking to the queen of nerds, she grinned. Kelly laughed. She pointed. Go. Try to learn something else. I'll stick with this. Lucia nodded. She crossed to the desk or barricade and started going through its drawers. She'd already been through all the filing cabinet drawers. If she was going to find something, it would have to be in the desk. Ten minutes later, Lucia hadn't found anything else about the mimic. She did, however, find a key on a key ring that was labelled storage. She remembered seeing a deadbolt on the door of the small room at the end of the hall, the one opposite the systems room. She wondered if the key was to that room. Shrugging, Lucia uh, pocketed the key. It might come in handy at some point. Ooh, storage. They're going to find out something in the storage room. Ooh. Mimic law? <laughs> Adrian and Jace paused at the edge of the stage and listened. The dining room was a disaster of broken furniture, construction materials, endoskeleton parts, and human body parts that looked like, wait, that it was like looking at a microcosm of an Armageddon. And the reason I like, uh, like, the reason I thought that was, like, mind-blowing, or not mind-blowing, but the reason I got excited at that is because in Security Breach, there is a cut feature or a cut boss battle that is called Endo Armageddon or something like that. Endogeddon or something. It, it like mixture of the words endoskeleton and Armageddon. Um, and so that could be related in some part, but it also could be like it, it could be making the blob, right? Because the blob has to fit into this somehow. We have our, we have our burn trap, but where is our blob? I have a feeling the blob is actually a mixture of robotic parts, suits and human parts. <laughs> Jace didn't want to be anywhere near this room, but Adrian was wa was right. What they needed would be out here. Jace was pretty proud of himself for the fact that he was still a functioning human being at this point. Spending even one minute in the abattoir that was the systems room was more than he'd ever thought he had in him. Somehow though, he'd managed to help Adrian scour the room for the fan's control panel, and when they'd found it on the main control panel at the back of the room, he'd been able to pick his way past the dregs of Joel and Wade so he could check to see if the fan was still going when Adrian toggled the fan switch to the off position. 
when flipping the switch had no effect, Jace had also helped Adrian locate a fuse box, but none of the switches in that box had stopped the fan either. Jace had even crawled behind the bottom part of the control panels, Adrian wouldn't fit back there, and looked for loose connections. He didn't find any. By the time they were done attempting to stop the fan, Jace knew every inch of the system's room, and he'd been desensitized to the carnage that filled the small space. The nose had been adjusted to the sink, so the stink in the room, the combination of a coppery blood odour and a reek of the fluids Joel's and Wade's bodies had released when they died. Now though, being out here in the open, Jace was losing his nerve again. His legs were f shaking, but he was not going to wuss out on Adrian. He stuck right with his friend. As Jace and Adrian sidled around the edge of the dining room, They'd heard a thud in the furthest of the adjacent party rooms. They froze and stared in that direction. We'd better hurry, Adrian whispered. He pointed to the left. I think that's what we need. Jace immediately saw what Adrian was looking at. He nodded, glanced toward the party room, and then, without discussing it with Adrian, he took off toward their prize. What they were looking for was wedged between a stack of concrete blocks and a pile of wood beams. It was in a tight spot. Jace figured he'd be able to reach it more easily than Adrian would. As he scurried over a litter of bright paper cups and plates, Jace idly wondered what had been going on in the place before everyone had been ripped apart. Had they been planning to remodel it? Use it as a storage room for decommissioned robots? I wish someone would have decommissioned the Mimic, Jace muttered under his breath as he squeezed between a stack of overturned barstool style red vinyl topped chairs and large metal toolbox. Jace crawled past an upside down table and he knelt. He reached out and managed to snag the metal foot of a long endoskeleton leg. He pulled on it. It didn't budge. Something scraped the floor behind him. He spun around. That is just me, Adrian whispered. I thought it might be too heavy for you. Jay shook his head. He was determined to be useful. He grunted and he tugged again. Maybe his determination gave him the strength he needed. The leg came loose. He started dragging it across the floor, shaking it to free it from the other endoskeleton parts entangled with it. Jace grimaced. These things are heavy. A thunk sounded from the party room. Adrian scrabbled up next to Jace. Let me help. We need to get moving. Jace didn't argue. Adrian reached around Jace and grasped the ankle of the metal leg. He jerked it and then lifted it up onto his shoulder. Come on, Adrian said. The dining room lights started flickering. We need to go, Adrian whispered. Now! Adrian got a good grip on the metal leg and clambered over the concrete blocks. He reached back to pull Jace to his feet. As soon as Jace was upright, Adrian pushed him back the uh, Adrian pushed him toward the back of the dining room. Jace started to run, but Adrian grabbed his shirt and yanked him to a stop. Jace yelped. Then he immediately realized why Adrian had stopped him. The mimic was there, just a few feet away. Rising up from behind a pile of endoskeleton arms and torsos, the mimic was no longer in the form of a monkey, or whatever it had been when it was outside the vent cover. Now it was some kind of blonde coloured dog, a mangled dog with one ragged ear and a torn muzzle. The mimic's metal teeth shone through the costume. The ends of its metal limbs jutted through the molted edges of the dog's paws. The mimic took a rasping step. The dining room went black. Something grabbed Jace's hand. He nearly screamed, but then he realised he was feeling skin. Not metal. It was Adrian. Jace let Adrian pull him backward, away from the mimic. The mimic's rasping, tapping footsteps moved closer, but terror gave Jace and Adrian speed they'd never found before. They floundered over the dining room debris, falling and getting back up again. Lurching, spinning, leaping, they kept moving forward. With the mimic's whirring approach right behind them, Jace and Adrian managed to fumble their way into the arcade. There, the lights were still working. That meant the mimic wasn't close on their heels. Adrian let Jace along a row of pinball machines. At the end of the road, they paused and listened. They could hear the mimic's footsteps. The footfalls weren't close. Adrian knelt and pulled Jace down next to him. Putting his mouth right next to Jace's ear, Adrian whispered, I think if we sneak out onto the small stage, we can slip behind the stage curtain and get to the far side of the big stage before the mimic realises what we've done. You with me? Jace nodded. He didn't want to be with Adrian. He wanted to be someplace else, any place else. He wished he could check out, take himself to an imaginary, imaginary place filled with happy, cute, benign things instead of a menacing, ugly, hostile thing. 
However, he knew his go-to way of coping with stress wasn't going to work. Crawling under a pinball machine and drawing bunnies was a sure way to become the Mimic's next victim. Adrian motioned for Jace to stay low, and he duck-walked around a skee-ball machine. They both peered into the dining room. The far side of it remained dark. That meant the Mimic was still over there. Adrian made a come on gesture, and he rose to his full height. Jace turned himself into Adrian's shadow. He stayed right at Adrian's side as Adrian darted toward the small stage and vaulted up onto it. Somehow, Adrian still held on to the heavy endoskeleton leg, and with his free hand, he reached down and pulled Jace up into the stage, or onto the stage. A clatter from the far side of the room froze them in their tracks. Adrian immediately dropped to the stage, flattening himself to its wood floor. Jace followed suit. They remained there for several seconds, breathing as quietly as they could. When they didn't hear anything else, Adrian began army crawling forward. Jace copied him. Together they slid through the rough, dusty stage floor and slipped behind the main curtain. Jace almost sneezed when the velvet fabric brushed against his nose, but he managed to suppress the urge. He wasn't going to be the reason they got killed. Behind the curtain, Adrian stood and helped Jace up. He motioned for Jace to follow, and he walked flat-footed, not making a sound, behind the curtain. Jace copied him again. They moved slowly, surreptitiously. So it took longer than Jace wanted for them to make it across the broad expanse. But they eventually got to the other side. When they did, Adrian eased back the curtain and looked out. He dropped the curtain and bent down to whisper in Jace's ear again. His breath was hot and forceful. The dining, the dining room lights are on again, but the lobby looks dark. I think the mimic went the other way. You ready? We need to get down the hall as fast as possible. Jace nodded. Okay. Adrian repositioned that heavy endoskeleton leg. Let's go. Adrian grabbed Jace's hand, and the two of them pushed through the curtains and ran down the stairs off the stage. Jace wanted to stop and check behind them to make sure the mimic wasn't coming after them but he didn't. Instead, he squeezed Adrian's hand and did his best to keep up as Adrian sprinted away from the dining room. <clears throat> oh my god, I thought we were at the end. We are a few pages away? What? I thought you were so close to the end. Okay. Adrian gently closed the door to the systems room. Before they'd entered, he looked da back down the hall and he hadn't seen anything, but the dining room was dark again. The mimic wasn't that far away. They'd have to be fast. Come on, Adrian said. Running past the torn pieces of Joel and Wade, Adrian didn't even bother to try to avoid the blood. There wasn't time. At the opening to the bottom of the chute, Adrian stopped and propped the metal leg against the outside of the furnace. Wait until I get in there with the leg, and then, as soon as you can, follow me. I think wedging this metal into the fan will stop it, but it may not hold for long. There also may not be enough room for me to get through, but you'll be able to. So, stay close. Oh my god, I can see it happening. I can definitely see it happening. One of them gets out, and the other few stay down there. And then the person on the outside has to try and think of a way to get the others out, or to tell someone or something. Oh, that would be really cool. That would be great. I think that would be a great way for the story to progress. Jace nodded. He wasn't letting himself think anymore, he was just reacting. Whatever Adrian told him he'd do, to, uh, to do, he'd do. Adrian punched Jace lightly on the upper arm. You've done good, Jace. Real good. Jace's eyes filled with tears. He blinked them away and nodded. He didn't trust himself to speak. Adrian levered himself up into the chute and then reached back out for the metal leg. The leg scraped the side of the furnace as it slid into the chute. The metal on metal rasp was unsettling, and so was the rasp that came from the outside the storage room. The sound was faint, but Jace's senses were attuned to it. He knew what it was the second he heard it. He got his confirmation a few seconds later when the lights flickered. Adrian must have seen the flicker as well. There's no time to get you in here, Adrian said. Go hide! Jace had already figured that out on his own. Before Adrian's finished speaking, Jace was scurrying around the end of the furnace, heading toward one of the control panels. He was ducking into the dark space behind the front of the panel when the lights in the systems room went out. Ooh. The interior of the furnace chute was tight and smelled strongly of rotten eggs and blood, but it had evenly spaced handholds and footholds, and it was an easy climb to the top. Adrian had just reached the apex of the shaft when the room went dark. As soon as it did, he froze. 
He heard the hissing and tapping of the mimic's footsteps. The creature was coming toward the bottom of the shaft. Jace, Adrian thought. Had Jace found a place to hide? Adrian badly wanted to go back down and find his friend, but the mimic was down there in the dark. There was no way Adrian was going to get to Jace. The only thing he could do now was try to get out through the fan and go for help. Adrian gingerly shifted position in the shaft. He hung onto a handhold with one hand and got a good grip on the metal leg with the other. Then, summoning all the strength he had left, he lifted the leg above his head. As soon as Adrian jammed the leg into place, he knew it wasn't going to be sturdy enough to do the job Adrian needed it to do. The fan was far more powerful than Adrian had assumed it was. Immediately, the flan's blade started scoring through the metal leg, spraying metal shavings into the air above Adrian's upturned face. He closed his eyes and looked away. The fan's gears ground. Adrian heard a snapping twang. The leg was violently wrenched from his grasp. Adrian uh, cringed at the metallic crunching that sounded like metal eating metal. The endoskeleton leg thrashed above Adrian. Its foot beat against Adrian's shoulder. Then Adrian felt specks of heat searing the top of his head. He heard a sputter. Without thinking, he looked up and was rewarded with more tiny burns. The fan was sparking. Would it stop turning? The metallic banging above Adrian's head got louder. It turned into a cacophony of metal shearing metal. Then part of the leg jumped out of the fan. It hit Adrian on the temple and Adrian lost his grip on the chute's handholds. He let out an involuntary cry. Adrian fell straight down the shaft. He skimmed along its walls, its handholds and footholds, battering him as it went. He fell faster and faster, as if he was zipping down an enclosed slide. The fall was short and painful, and in the few seconds that he was descending, Adrian didn't have time to think about what would happen next. This was a mercy, because what did happen next was Adrian's worst nightmare. He shot down to the bottom of the shaft, and out through its opening right into the extended arms of the Mimic. Oh! Oh! Jace cowered behind the control panel, breathing as shallowly as he could. He had listened to the Mimic's footsteps pass him and head toward the bottom of the chute. Go, Adrian, Jace had thought. Adrian had to get the fans stopped and get out. He just had to. When Jace had heard metal screaming and banging, he had hoped for the best. But then he'd heard Adrian's cry. Jay started to leave his hiding place. He had to help his friend. Before he could shove himself free though, Jace heard Adrian cry out again. This cry was much louder than the first one. It wasn't just a cry. It was a howl. It was a caterwaul, a caterwaul, a keen of indescribable pain. Jace knew what the sound meant. The mimic had Adrian. Jace compressed himself into the smallest ball possible. He let the tears sluice down his cheeks as he listened to his friend die. Oh, that is a great ending to that one. Um, wow, I actually didn't think anyone was gonna die here. Well, we have three people left, I think. We have three people left, and at the very least, four books. <laughs> so, surely people can't die anymore. I think, I think we, we've got a, a lot to go with this, but it's getting good, uh, and I feel like we're going to learn a lot more about the Mimic, we're going to learn about Burn Trap, we're going to learn about, um, what's it called, Molten Freddy, B the Blob, um, yeah, this is so interesting, uh, I'm so intrigued to see where this goes, and we're going to find out very soon, because of not only the leaks, which I'm going to be reading either tomorrow or the next day, but we're also going to be reading the full book, in a week or two. So stay tuned for that. Make sure you subscribe and I'll see you then. Goodbye.